supposed to be sitting here. <laughs> Just. You're supposed to be. Get real close to it. Hello? Did somebody mute this? Here. <laughs> here, go here. No, here. It's not. My heart is rejoicing. A year ago this week, my mom passed away, and it was a rejoicing time, and I wasn't sure how I would handle it this week, especially on Monday was the day. I opened up my devotional, as I always do, and it talked about the Lord. He said, I lay tiny treasures before you throughout the day, and I want you to look for those tiny treasures, and then I want you to take them and offer them to me as a bouquet of thankfulness. So instead of having a heavy heart, and I'm not sure as I would have, I looked for the treasures. I looked for the tiny treasures and I wrote them down. It was an incredible day for me. My heart was just rejoicing. The whole week has been rejoicing. At the end of the day, I was getting cleaned up and I knew that I needed to hand it back. I needed to offer it back up to the Lord. And so as I was getting cleaned up, the Lord said, you haven't done that yet. So in my house, we have Gammy's room. That was where she stayed when she used to come and visit. So I went back to that room, and I laid prostrate on the floor. And there were deep sobs that came out of me, deep, deep sobs that poured out of me. And then those deep sobs turned to thankfulness okay. and gratefulness. And then I offered, I had that little card with me, and I offered it. I read those back to the Lord, what I had experienced just that day, just that day. And there was that peace, and there was that joy, that contentment that only the Lord can give. Amen. Could I have thought of all that? Never in a million years. I don't think that way. I don't go that direction. But the Lord knew what I needed that day. He knew what I needed this week. And so I offered it to the Amen. Lord, and I'm just so grateful. And I've been looking, I'm always looking for tiny treasures and thankfulness, but it's made me even more alert this week. So I offer that to you, and I share with you, to look for the little tiny treasures that the Lord offers it, whether it be the sunrise, the sunset, your loved one next to you, whatever it is, keep your eyes open, Amen. and he'll bless you. Thank Amen. You. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Hope you found plenty of opportunity for Thanksgiving over this last weekend. Uh, personally, we just had a glorious time with family and friends and enjoyed the, the fellowship and the fun. Got to see healings take place in people's hearts and lives. Just a good time. I hope you uh, experience those things yourself. God's in, you know, we've been doing this series on prayer and we've been seeing God answer so many prayers. And maybe one Sunday here in the future we'll just have you line up and talk about all the prayers that God has answered, you know, in your situation. You say, well, God had an answer in your mind. Have you asking, all right? Be asking, it helps, all right? That's the first step to getting him answered is praying them and then see and experience what the Lord will say and what the Lord will do for you. Hallelujah. Now, I thought a great time as we come to the end of the Thanksgiving celebration uh, to put it all in perspective again is to share uh, the Lord's Supper together and have communion together today. It also kind of a, is a great introduction, not kind of, it is, into the... Uh, the Christmas celebration, the time where we start remembering and celebrating the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ because we do know he was born with purpose. And the purpose was to come and give himself as a sacrifice for our sins. The purpose was to present himself as the offering, that, that perfect and acceptable offering unto God on our behalf. So well, I, I think it's a good marriage in, in the context of the calendar of events that are going on for us to pause today and, and just share in the Lord's Supper. As always, before we receive the Lord's Supper, I think it's important we prepare our minds and our hearts to uh, take the Lord's Supper and take communion together because of all that it, that it does represent. Each time we share in the Lord's Supper, I try to present some things from Scripture in regard to the ordinance of the Lord's Supper and, and just exactly what it means. So I'm going to give you about six brief things here I want to talk to you about today in regard to truths in pertaining to the Lord's Supper. Six distinct truths, I think, which are brought out, especially when you read what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There's that little section. Paul says to the church of Corinth, I want to share with you what the Lord shared with me. I mean, that's a Joe Arms translation, but that's the way it breaks down. 
Well, why did the Lord share it with him? Because he was not there. Uh, the night that the Lord was betrayed. He was not there the night that the Lord instituted the, 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 the remembrance meal of the new covenant. And so the Lord met with the apostle and spoke to his heart about what took place that night. I just think that'd be kind of obviously kind of radically in, in neat. Amen, for lack of better words. Uh, radically cool. Have the Lord sit down and reminisce about something with you. And reminisce the moment that, that, that I was with the 12 in the upper room that night, Paul. And while I was there, we sat down, we just finished the Passover and Judas, you know what he did, you know, right before we instituted the, the memorial meal of, of, the, of the new covenant meal, you know, Judas bailed out, you know, and I sent him out because he wasn't really one of us. And so as he dismissed, then I, I reminded the disciples what these elements meant, what they stood for. And I told them, can you just imagine being in that moment where the apostles getting this word from, from God? Listen, we do remember it in such a way today is that we can, we can look over these things ourselves. And this is exactly where the apostle Paul is pointing to in the scripture as Paul now reminds the church of what the Lord reminded him about that the Lord had done so many years before this moment in time. The first distinct truth is we remember always that this is a memorial meal. It's symbolic, but it, what this symbolism of it all does, it represents the central truth of what we believe of our Christianity. And that is that salvation is no other way but through the Lord Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made on the cross for us. Let me put it in simple terms. You would go to hell if it weren't up for what Christ had done for you. The Bible says all men are condemned. We're born in sin. We're born as sons of wrath. We're born, in Ephesians says, as children of disobedience. But Jesus Christ came as sent by the Father to come and become that absolute perfect sacrifice for our sins. No other sacrifice was acceptable. Our sacrifice was unacceptable. Why? Because we're sinners. We're, we're blemished. We're scarred. We're tainted with sin. So Jesus comes and stands as the, the scripture says, the King James Version says, he is the propitiation. He stands in, he takes our place. Jesus shed his blood for all men. Now, even, I mean, even think about what was happening at the cross the day that he died. Around the cross, the, that group that's gathered there on that gruesome day of the crucifixion, I mean, they're kind of like, like butchers to slay the, a spotless lamb. That, that, that appeared at, the, at, Ga, at Calvary, at Golgotha that day. And they came dressed in all kinds of clothes. I mean, there were, there were the religious, the ecclesiastical, the sophisticated scribes and the Pharisees and the scholars and the priest of, of the day. They all showed up and, and they were what we would call the, the religious elite of the day. They're there. But not only are they there, some were just the thugs from the street. They just followed what's going on. You know, they just, they, they, they just the vermin of the culture. Then over in another group would be those who would be dressed in royalty, you know, the high, they're, they're, they're dressed in their robes of high office and their supposed nobility. They're standing there to watch what's going on behalf of the empire or whatever. And then there were the Roman soldiers, these battle hardened warriors standing around, many of them so hard, not even realize the context of anything that's going on. They're gambling at the foot of Jesus, playing games at the cross. All these are gathered there. They came from every social strata that you can imagine. Which, which gives us a clear picture who Jesus reaches. He reaches all people who will come to him in faith. He reaches all people who repent of their sins and trust in him as their Lord and Savior. All that's taking place. This meal, again, speaks of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, when he had given thanks, Jesus broke it and said, this is my body, which is, next two words, for you. This is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Remembrance of me for what? Remembrance of me for doing for you what had to be done and what nobody else could do. But it's also the, the apostle that wrote the church of Corinth that this was about the fellowship of Christ's body. In verses 17 and 18, he's, there's a reproof that comes through. He says, I'm giving you this, this instruction. I do not praise you. Because you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. That's why we always have this moment where people need to examine themselves, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the idea is, Paul's telling the church of Corinth, this meal represents reconciliation. What does that mean? To bring people together. 
Who's it bring together? It brings sinners to the holy God of all creation. It unites our hearts to God's heart. This is what we call communion, which means fellowship. We're community. We're a people who are committed to God. So obviously, we don't want to have hearts that are dirty with him. But Paul is saying it goes beyond that. It has to do with your hearts and relationship to one another. If your heart is dirty towards your brother or your sister, if there's something not right between you, then get it right. Now, let me, let me clarify something. That does not mean that you and I will always agree on everything. Well, I don't even agree with myself on everything. <laughs> We're not going to agree on everything. But see, we are a different kind of people. Now, when we disagree, we don't hate. When we disagree, we don't act in spite. When we disagree, we don't reject. When we disagree, we don't get bitter. And if we do, we repent. And this is what Paul is saying. This is a, this is a fellowship meal. Make sure your fellowship's right. Get your heart right. Look around the room today. All around the room. <laughs> Somebody you're not right with, get it right today. The blood of Jesus gives peace. We can have unity. We can have fellowship. We can have an agreement in the, in, in the grace of God. So he says, listen, this, this, this is the problem. He says, you need to get these, these issues resolved. The third element of this part and principle is a, it's a feast of thanksgiving for the salvation that it represents. Jesus said when he broke the cup, when he broke the bread and he, and he, he presented the cup, in those, both those instances, he said, he broke it and, and said, this is my body, which is, you do this in remembrance of me. But it starts out, that verse says, and when he had given thanks. We talk about the Thanksgiving celebration and Thanksgiving season. And all too often, that's the last thing that ha happens. It's a season of Thanksgiving. It's a season of poor turkey. <laughs> he gave himself, <laughs> but the rest of us are not sure we want to give ourselves. It's a season of gratitude. <clears throat> it's a season where we bless the Lord. And if Jesus, just a moment, maybe you get, don't miss this part. If Jesus, in the light of knowing, I mean, he's on the verge, it's, it's the evening, in the morning, you know, even in that night, he's going to be taken captive. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be whipped throughout the morning. He'll be tortured. He'll be tranced around like some clown in a circus that brought back for more beating, ultimately being nailed to a cross. And what's he saying? He's lifting up, so this is my body. He knows everything's getting ready to happen. He says, and he gave thanks. Wow. In the midst of suffering, he gave thanks. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the answer for whatever suffering we're going through. Read the whole of First and Second Peter. Read all those passages that talks about the suffering of the saints. And it's always crowned how? With thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. He's suffering due to the will of God. And so he's giving thanks. It should be the same thing in our life. That whatever we're bearing, whatever we're dealing with, whatever we're, we're experiencing, we need to stop and offer the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. It's called a sacrifice because sometimes it is. We don't want to praise the Lord. We don't want to do that. It's against all our flesh. It's against everything screaming in our mind. And we want to. But this should be a, a, a celebration of thanksgiving. The fourth principle about this, I'm trying, but it's not going there. Go to number four for me, would you? Or move the mouse back over where it's supposed to go, one or the other. It's a witness to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know what it represents, but this stands as another witness that, hey, Jesus died for our sins. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do what? You proclaim the Lord's death. This is a proclamation that Jesus died. We know it's the central truth of the gospel, but we need to give this proclamation. And it literally says this is a sermon in symbol. As you symbolically, you know, deal with this, this whole process of receiving the Lord's Supper, it is this, it's, it's symbolically of the, of the sacrifice of Christ's death for your sin. It witnesses to him, to what he's done. You proclaim the Lord's death. And it is. I mean, you look at the bread, it is Passover bread. That's literally Passover bread that we use. And it is prepared in the way it's prepared. It's marked with those brown marks that are stripes from the, from the heat of, of the oven. And it's got the holes where it's been pricked and penetrated with, with an implement says to make a, a mark there. And it's, it's unleavened bread, which means it has no yeast. Now the yeast represents sin in the New Testament. So it's pure unleavened bread. 
And it represents the suffering, the furnace of sin and death and hell and the grave that Jesus would experience on our part. He did that for you. When you hold that bread in your hand, you look at those marks on that bread and you remember what Christ did for you. It's a witness of the sufferings of the Christ of Christ's death. And the cup's obvious. Just as the, as, as the grape and the life of the grape would be squeezed out and the juice would be poured in the glass, Jesus poured out his blood as an offering for our sins and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. What a sermon in pictures. What a testimony. What a testimony of God's love. What a testimony of suffering when you look at each of these things and consider what's really happened to these things to produce the bread and the wine. There's agony involved. There's pressure involved. There's suffering involved. There's heat, pressure, intensity, scarring that's involved. It's a witness to Christ's death, but it's also a feast of hope and celebration. First Corinthians 11, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim in the Lord's death. What's the last three words? Say that again. Until he comes. And by the way, he's coming. He's coming. He's coming here and he's coming back and he's coming back for us. He's coming. There are more prophecies in regard to the second coming of Jesus than there are in regard to the first coming of Jesus. And he, did he come the first time? Yes. Double that amount of promises about a second coming. If he came the first time, mark it down. He's coming back. Amen. Could be today. Could be. It'd be it'd mess up service, wouldn't it? <laughs> you have to leave all your equipment with the Antichrist. <laughs> He's coming back. It's exciting to think. And it says, he, he told his disciples, even at that minute, oh, I'm not going to do this again with you, but when you do it, you remember me. But when I do it again, it's going to be with you. Woo! Hallelujah. We're going to do this with the Lord Jesus. We're going to have him there personally where we think him visibly personified in front of us. We can reach out, we can touch him, we can embrace him. And there we remember his suffering. They remember the sacrifice for our sins. As often as you do this now, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes and he is coming. So there's, there is, you know, as, as we think about the sorrow and the suffering of the Lord's uh, agony here, we also remember, hey, he went through death and he, he conquered death, hell in the grave, and he rose from the dead and he's coming back again. He's coming. The sixth and last point here, it is a, it is a diagnostic meal. Say, so what do you mean? It gives us an opportunity to, to look at ourselves. We examine our own walk. Paul told us, let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. It's, it's, it's not where the pastor examines you. He says, oh, well, you can't take the Lord's Supper today or you can't take the Lord's Supper today or the elders say you can't take the Lord's Supper today. This is an important part of your personal walk with Jesus. When you look at your own heart and say, I'm, I, I'm, not in a situ I'm, I'm not in a place in my life where I should take the Lord's Supper. But it doesn't stop there. Remember, this represents forgiveness. So at that point, I say, hey, I'm repenting of my sin. Because every time we receive the Lord's Supper, it ought to be a time of renewal. It ought to be a time of confession. It ought to be a time of revival. Shouldn't it be? Where we just take a look and say, this is not the way I'll be living my life. I want to get right with God. And so even before we take it, the apostle said, so before you take it, examine yourself. What do I do in examine it? Get right. Well, Brother Joe, I, I, I want to get right, and I, I, I'm, I, but it's, 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 you don't understand. It's going to take a while for me to get right. I don't think so. No, it's not. You just need to confess your sin. That's where it starts. That's the starting point. Get right. Well, I got some stuff I need to fix. He'll take care of that. Don't you love the old hymn that says, Just as I am, without one plea, that that thy blood was shed for me? Just as I am. I, I can't clean myself up first. Nothing but the blood cleanses me. I can't make myself better. I just can only throw myself at the cross and say, I'm a mess. Help me, Lord Jesus, forgive me and cleanse me. But I have to be honest enough to have this diagnosis take place. I think there's too many people are just afraid to take a, a real look at their own life. Why, why do we want to do that? We're too busy looking at other people's lives. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I'm not near as bad as sister. What's her name? I'm not that bad. That's, that's not the diagnosis we're supposed to be making. It's all right for the doctor to diagnose you, but you need to diagnose you too. 
And I think that's where David was, was praying when he said, Lord, examine me and see if there be any harmful way in me. Because there can be a lot of harmful ways in us. We're harming ourselves. We're harming those we love. We're harming other people because we're not living for Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to stand and we'll just take a moment here this morning. If you'd like to come to the altar and just between you and the Lord, spend a moment here. Feel free to do so. Just, just come and, 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 and let's, get, let's get hearts that are open and available for God to speak to us.